Hi, before I start this story, I would like to say that I had no intent of sharing this with anyone. My plan to do what I had to do and be done with it. Forget about it. Forever. Now, I'm not a violent person, or at least I wasn't before all of this happened. I'm sitting on the roof of some old ass building in the middle of fucking nowhere. I haven't seen a human face in a good week, and I've literally been living off of scraps I bought before I fell off the face of the earth. But that is beside the point. I feel like if I don't tell anyone this story, then I will go insane. People need to know what the fuck is out there, and how there are people that will change your life forever and not even give a shit. So, on to the story. My name is Mason, Mason Hackworth. I'm a 34 year old man who used to be a firefighter for my own town. I prefer to keep my former place of residence a secret so I can protect the identity of my former friends and family. About one year ago, I had recently married my wife. Her name was Elizabeth. I would call her Liz because I knew it would irritate her. She was my high school sweetheart and I just knew that one day I would get on one knee and ask her the most important question a man would ask. When she said yes, I was ecstatic. I had never been more excited for anything in my entire life. When the wedding day came and I saw her walk down the aisle, her father next to her, I knew my life was about to change. It was about to change forever, and boy, I couldn't wait. About a week after the wedding, we were living with her parents while we looked for a house. Many came to mind, but one stuck out. It was about six miles from where we lived and close enough for both of us to be able to commute to our jobs. She knew my aspirations of becoming a firefighter, so she wanted a house where she could feel at home while I was living at the firehouse. This house was perfect. Next thing I knew, we were, we were moving in. My life was just starting and even though I had just turned 33 at the time, I felt like a 21 year old who had just gotten told he could drink. Fast forward three weeks and we got the news my wife was pregnant. It was one of the happiest days of my life. I remember jumping up and down with glee as my wife told me the good news. Man, I thought, life could not get any better. Fast forward three weeks and I had gotten accepted into the firehouse. Man, 24 months of fire academy and 200 hours of EMT training. And I could finally say I was a firefighter. Man, my life was awesome. I started in one week. That one week in between me being accepted and me starting was the week that would put me where I am today. That Tuesday, I was sitting in the office room on the computer we had just bought and Elizabeth, who had just barely started to show signs of pregnancy, walked in to tell me she was going to bed. I told her I loved her and that I would be down within the hour. She walked out of the room and I continued my routinely internet browsing. You know, stuff like, you know, what to eat and what I need to do to prepare for my first day as a firefighter, good workout routines to stay in shape, what was going on in the political world, just searching for anything that piqued my interest. I was on YouTube and I found this video called Quick and Easy Way to Get to the Dark Net. Huh, I thought. I had never heard of the dark net. I clicked on the video and began to watch. Some ad about Geico or whatever, I, I can't fucking remember, came up. And as soon as the option to skip it came up, I clicked it. The video started. A silly little intro came up of the person who created the video, and then the introduction. Hey, what's going on guys? Today in this video we're going to be going into the deep web, the guy said with an enthusiastic voice. The deep web is the internet you cannot access using a standard search engine, and it is where a lot of illegal and scary stuff is. This got me listening. Illegal and scary? I wasn't much of the risk taker, but this stuff sounded cool. To know there was a whole world out there hidden from everyone else that only people who knew how to access it could get to really interested me. I looked at the time, 9.34 p.m. I could mess around for about 30 minutes, then mute my wife in bed. Apparently you needed this search engine called Tor. 
I followed his instructions and downloaded it. Now, before I go any further, I want everyone to know that I do not condone anybody going onto the deep web. Those silly tutorials you find on the internet of how to get to the deep web are pure bullshit. That isn't the deep web. There is an extremely fucked up and dark side to the internet that is very hard to get to and that very few people know how to get to. I only wish I hadn't stumbled upon it, but anyway. I started up tour and went to this site called The Hidden Wiki. There was a lot of cool stuff, places where you could buy drugs and weapons, you could read about conspiracies, and it was pretty cool. The inner explorer in me came out and I started clicking link after link after link, leading me further and further into this black tunnel people called the deep web. I couldn't stop. The deeper I got into this, the more fucked up things got. Hitmen, fake IDs, counterfeit money, security cameras you could pay Bitcoin to get into and watch. It was pretty wild. I just kept clicking and clicking and looking back on it, I was a fucking dumbass for doing so. Eventually, I came across this little button on the corner of my screen. The screen was black with a few little cold lines in green, but that bright small orange button on the top right of my screen got my gaze. I stared at it for a second, not knowing if I should click or not, but me being the naive fuck I was, I did. As soon as I clicked it, it redirected me to a screen with a cartoon brick wall and a title that said, The Blood Circus. What the fuck? I thought. I was about to click out of it because I thought I had gone too far, but before I could, a little chat box popped up in the corner of my screen. Welcome to the circus. I will be your host. Would you like me to give you a tour? I stared at the sentence for a good five minutes thinking it was some automatic bot just instantly sending messages, but when a new message read, you there, popped up. My heart, my heart stopped. I slowly started typing. What is this place? That was the dumbest move ever. Now he knew I hadn't been here before and most likely knew I was some guy just fucking around on the deep web. He replied, Haha, scariest place on the fucking internet. The show is starting in three minutes. You want in or not? Sure, I stupidly typed. Seconds later, a message popped up saying, Very well, however, I must warn you, no one who enters the blood circus ever comes out the same. Thinking this was just some funny little saying, I replied, That's fine. And I was then quickly redirected to some type of live feed and a chat box to the right of it. People were talking in it like you would see people talking over text. Ugh, I have to go to work tomorrow and I really don't want to go. Or, is it raining for anyone? It's a fucking hurricane where I am. The casual nature of the people's messages kind of relieved me and I began to relax. Suddenly, the live feed window came on and in shitty 240p quality, it showed a man dressed in all black with a skull mask on leaning close in to the camera. People in the message box started showing their excitement as to what was going on, and I'll be honest, I started to get a little confused. The man on the camera stepped back, revealing they were in some cement underground bunker basement looking thing, and there was what looked like to be a piss and shit in the corner of the room. In the center of the room was someone blindfolded and tied up. They were bloody and on their knees. They looked like they had been tortured. The quality was very bad, but from what I could tell, he wasn't even that old. 15 at most. What the fuck? I said out loud. I began to tense up. In hindsight, I should have closed it and just been done with it, but I didn't. The man in black with the skull mask on leaned over the boy and pushed him forward, landing him on his hands and knees. He was ass naked and he let out some kind of a moan of desperation and pain. He was muzzled, but it sounded like he was saying the words, Help me God, please help me. The man in black proceeded to unbuckle his pants and started fucking the boy. 
The boy let out muffled cries for help and screams. I was in shock. People in the chat cheering him on, giving instructions of what he should do next. What the hell is this place? I snapped out of my shock and began frantically trying to close out whatever the hell I was watching. Nothing happened. I clicked the exit button well over a hundred times. I tried to task manager my way out of it, but it wasn't even showing up as one of my tasks. I was literally being forced to watch the horror that laid before me. The man in black thrusted his hips back and forth as the boy was screaming for help. Did people have no sympathy? What is this? All of a sudden, the man stopped and looked up at the camera. He walked over to it and looked at it closely. What's the rush, Mason? I stopped trying to close out and I froze. I looked at the screen. I was trembling, but other than that, I was paralyzed with fear. The man on the screen tilted his head and said, Going somewhere? That was it. I was going to get out of this one way or another. I reached around my desk and pulled the power cord, grabbed the computer and the monitor, went out back and burned them in our driveway. I went back inside, and to my surprise, none of the noise had woken up my wife. She lay there in the bed, asleep. I stood in the doorway and looked at her for about 10 minutes before crawling into bed. I looked at the time on the digital clock next to the bed. It was 3 in the morning. I stared at the ceiling, wondering when I was going to tell my wife about the burnt computer in our driveway tomorrow, because there's no way I was going to tell her I watched a teenage boy get raped, and then my name get spoken out by some stranger. That was the last thing I remember before waking up the next morning to sounds of pots clinking in the kitchen. Liz was up making breakfast. Everything seemed normal. The sun was shining, I was alive, and my wife was in the kitchen. I got up and went into the kitchen. You look tired. Are you okay? My wife asked. Yeah, just had a, a hard time sleeping last night. I'm, I'm fine, though. Well, all right. I'm making eggs, so sit down. I'll get my big, strong firefighter a plate, okay? I sat down, and within the minute, I had a nice, steaming plate of scrambled eggs in front of me. She sat down next to me with some coffee and started to complain to me about what all she'll do today and how she should just quit her job and find another thing that makes her happy. I must have looked weird because she shook my shoulder and said, Hey, are you sure you're okay? You're, you're acting strange. I looked up at her with a concerned face and sighed. It's nothing, honey. Just kind of a bad dream and it woke me up. I had a hard time falling asleep. Thanks for being concerned though, I, I love you. She smiled, and rubbed my back and said, I love you too, I'm here if you need anything. I looked at her and smiled and began to eat my eggs. As soon as I was done, I told her I needed to run to the supermarket to pick up a few things we were running short on and that I would be back in a bit. She said okay, and I was on my way. At the supermarket, I had some time alone to really sit back and think about what I had saw last night. I knew the internet wasn't always the prettiest thing out there, but to know that shit like that actively went on in the hidden corners of the web that not a whole lot of people knew about made me physically sick to my stomach. Then I realized something that made me almost throw up. I remember the guy on the YouTube video saying how important it was to protect your IP on the deep web so people couldn't find out your information or where you lived. I didn't even think about protecting my information. Oh shit. I thought, now some sick fuck probably has my information about where I live and could potentially do harm to me, or even worse, against my pregnant wife. I didn't even purchase what I had picked out at the store. I left my cart in the middle of the aisle and sprinted to my car. I'm surprised I didn't get pulled over by a cop on my way home because I was going well over a hundred miles an hour. When I got home, I saw my door had been opened. This made my heart sink. Goosebumps the size of golf balls popped up on me and I slowly made my way into the house. What I saw made me drop down to my knees. My wife, or what was left of her, scattered on the floor, intestines, 
lungs, her heart all in different places. I puked all over the floor. Tears rolled down my face at the sight of the woman I loved, dead, all around me. I saw a note on the floor. I picked it up. On it, it read, Next time, don't wander into places you aren't welcome. I puked a second time. Th that bastard did this. He traced my IP, found out where I lived, and murdered the love of my life. I only wish I was the one at home instead of my lovely, innocent wife. My wife was dead because I was being a dumbass and looking at things I had no business looking at. I called the police as soon as I composed myself and told them that they needed to get here now. They arrived in about 10 minutes and investigated the scene. The officers were obviously disgusted and their disgust turned into rage once I told them that she was pregnant told them everything, how I tried getting on the deep web, I accidentally stumbled across a sick video, and how the guy in the video found my IP and did this to her. As angry as they were, they couldn't do anything because I couldn't provide them with a URL. How the hell was I supposed to remember a goddamn URL with all the shit that happened last night? Angry but trying to compose myself, I told them that they should just leave. They sent in a cleanup crew to pick up the mess and they were on their way. I went back inside to my now empty house and sat on the couch and began to scream. I screamed out of rage and anger. I began breaking things and throwing things. I smashed our TV screen with a lamp and by the time I was done, it looked like a tornado had went through the damn house. I was no longer sad. I was furious. I was going to find the bastard that did this and give him what he deserved. I grabbed that note he had left and put it in my pocket. I began to pack. I packed clothes, food, water, and my credit card. Everything someone would need for a road trip. I was going to the ends of the earth to find this sick bastard and put an end to him. I put a suitcase in the back of my car and took one last look at the house. I didn't know where I was going, but I knew for damn sure I was never returning here. I got in my car and drove off. My first stop was the local gun shop. After all, to put an end to someone's life, you were going to need a weapon, right? I walked into the store and an old friend I knew from high school was in there. Hey, Tim Tebow! He shouted. I looked a lot like Tim Tebow, a lot of people would say, so I was gracefully given that name back in high school of freshman year. I instantly told him to shut the fuck up and walked to the guy behind the counter. I didn't want to tell him I was about to go track someone down and murder them so I asked him what the most reliable and most efficient gun they had was. He went around back, came out with a decent sized handgun. Zig Sauer P226, this thing will never fail you. How much? I asked. 1200 I pulled out my wallet and gave him my credit card. He asked me for my name so he could do a quick background check on me and as soon as he figured out I had no criminal record, he put the gun in the case and handed it to me. I thanked him and walked out, I got in my car and sped off. My journey had begun. I didn't care how long it was going to take, but I was going to find that guy. The next thing I needed was a laptop so I could more easily find this person. I went into Best Buy in the next town over and asked for a good laptop. They handed me some HP laptop that I didn't even know the exact name of and said it was going to cost me $1000 not including tax. I remembered in order to get a connection I was going to need a hotspot so I could have internet. I asked the man to direct me to where they kept their MiFi's and I went over and grabbed one. I walked up to the counter and purchased both the laptop and the hotspot and quickly got out and drove off again. I drove for about two hours before I decided now would be a good spot to pull over and do my first bit of research. I pulled into a Carl's Jr. parking lot and went inside. I wasn't hungry at all so I just went to the back of the restaurant, sat down and fired up my hotspot. I opened the new laptop 
and went through all of the registration bullshit, set up a password and an email, about 10 minutes I was in. This is where I got lost. How was I going to track down a dude whose name I didn't even know? I didn't know what he looked like or if he was even a guy to be honest. I sat there for about 20 minutes not knowing what to do. I began growing angry. I slammed down on the table, fuck, as loud as I could. Everyone in the restaurant turned to look at me and I sat there awkwardly. I looked at the time, 12.03 AM. I needed a hotel room. I picked up my things and drove to this motel six that wasn't too far away. I didn't even know the name of the town I was in, but frankly, I didn't care. I asked the lady at the desk for a room for one night and she said it would be $250. Once again, I wiped out my credit card, paid, and then walked up to the room and laid on the bed. Before I opened up my laptop, I sat on the bed, staring at the ceiling fan going around and around. Let me tell you, it's crazy how much your life can change in less than 24 hours. As I lied down on the bed and opened up the laptop, I remember what the police officer said to me at the crime scene. Since you can't provide a URL, there's nothing we can do. I quickly tried to remember what the name of the site was. Oh, what, what was that name? I said out loud. Then all of a sudden, it came to me. The Blood Circus. I quickly did a Google search on the Blood Circus. Nothing that I cared for was showing up. There was a band named The Blood Circus. Apparently, there was a short film called The Blood Circus, but nothing about a live feed of some sick bastard raping kids and then tracking you down. Desperate for answers, I then googled The Blood Circus Deep Web. This is where it got interesting. The third link down said, I lost my family because of this. I sat up straight and clicked on it. It was an article of a man who had been messing around on the deep web, much like I had, and had stumbled across a website with brick walls as the background, and a chat message that read, Welcome to the Blood Circus. He said he had been warned that no one comes out of the Blood Circus the same. He then described how he tried to exit the site, and that the man on the camera began reading out his personal information. After destroying his computer, while he was at work, Someone had come by his home and murdered his kids. This was exactly what I was looking for. I found massive relief knowing there was someone else out there that knew my pain. I had to get into contact with this guy. The only problem was, this thread was back in 2008. For all I know, this man could be dead right now, killed off by the same guy at a later date. I didn't care. I had to try. An email, a number, an address, anything. I had to talk to this man. It was around that time. I couldn't keep myself awake any longer. I fell asleep with my laptop in my lap. The next morning, I awoke to the sounds of birds chirping outside and housekeeping knocking on my door. I told them I didn't need cleaning right now and as I could hear them walking away, I quickly opened my laptop. I had forgotten to turn it off last night and of course it died. Shit, I said. I pulled out the charger that came with it, plugged it in, and patiently waited for the damn thing to start up. As I waited, I felt something in my pocket. I reached in, and I could feel something like paper. I slowly pulled it out of my pocket. I opened it and read the words, Next time, don't wander into places you aren't welcome. That was the note that the murderer had left. I sat there staring at it for at least 10 minutes. A tear rolled down my cheek as memories of my wife began to flood back. All of the emotion I was holding in within these 24 hours began to come pouring out of me like a waterfall. I started bawling, couldn't control myself. I'm not much of the crier, but I sounded like a baby begging for his pacifier. The memories were just, they were too much. The time we first met at the fair back in 1997. The time I asked her to be my girlfriend in front of the theater about two months later on a Friday night. The time her grandmother passed away due to leukemia and how I never left her side during that whole ordeal. 
the time I got down on my right knee on the pitcher's plate at that Red Sox game. <laughs> Fuck, I said. Why did this happen to me? But I knew exactly why this happened to me. It happened because I couldn't keep my fucking curiosity to myself and stumbled into something I never should have. This was my fault. All of it. I couldn't blame that man that murdered her for my negligence. He was simply protecting his own ass. I then remembered I made a promise to find that sick bastard that was responsible for my wife's death and end him. I looked to my right and into my reflection in the mirror. I stared at myself for a good hour before even moving my head. I looked at the gun in its box next to my suitcase. Like I said, I had vowed to find that man who caused the death of my wife and kill him. And well, I already had. I slowly walked over and picked up the box. I opened it and stared at the black handgun with two magazines of ammo in the box as well. The words, Sig Sauer, professionally engraved on the side. I picked it up out of the box and loaded it around. I cocked it around and started staring at myself in the mirror again. As I stared deep into my own soul through the mirror, I slowly raised the gun and placed it on my right temple. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I had found the man that had caused my wife to die. On the bright side, I would see her again soon. I stood there for at least another hour, a loaded gun to my damn head, and me being too much of a pussy to pull the trigger. I then looked down and noticed something. My wallet was open, and in it was a picture. It had two people in it, but I couldn't tell who they were. I stared at this picture for a minute before realizing it was me and my wife. It was us at high school prom back in 2000. We were 16 and our whole lives ahead of us. I snapped the hell out of it. I put the gun down and refocused my sights. This was not my fault. I had no intention of my wife dying. Yes, I should not have gone to the deep web, but my wife's death? That was this man's fault. He deserved to die. Not me. I closed my wallet, put the gun back in its case, fired up my laptop. I remembered that I needed to get back to the page with the man that had the similar experience. I went to the forum and checked his profile page. He had an email. I'm not going to mention it for privacy reasons, but I did email him. I sent him an email saying how the exact same thing that happened to him happened to me. It was a long shot. For all I knew, he could have switched emails a long time ago and will never see this message, but damn it, it was all I had. I waited for him to respond. Nothing. Two hours went by. Nothing. Soon, three hours. Still nothing. I was growing impatient. The time was getting close to where I needed to check out and I was desperate for answers. About four and a half hours into waiting, I decided to give up. He was either dead or switched emails. As soon as I was about to close the laptop, I got an alert. It was him. I quickly opened it to see the message saying, call me, and his phone number was listed below. Without hesitation, I pulled my phone out of my pocket and dialed the number. It rang for a minute, but after about the fourth ring, I could hear the phone pick up. Hello, said the voice. He had a deep voice. He sounded to be about maybe in his mid-fifties. I could almost guarantee by the sound of his voice he had a beard and was most likely wearing a cowboy hat. Hello, are you there? I said. I came across your forum and, and saw that you had lost your family to the same person that killed my wife and for the same reasons. There was a pause. I heard him take a deep breath and eventually say, A good lesson learned for going on the deep web. What? A good lesson learned? What? I was about to scream at him, but I quickly realized this could be my only chance of finding this man. I calmly asked, I'm looking for the man that did this. Did you try looking for him? <laughs> You'll never find him. I spent 10 years looking for him and came so close, but he was just, he was too smart for me. So close. What do you mean? 
He actually came close to finding this bastard. What do you mean, you came close? You know where he is? Not really. Well, not the exact location, but I can give you a general area. Finally, some kind of break. Not that it will help. He outsmarted me, and I am almost certain he will outsmart you. I don't care. I need to find this man. I need to find him and give him what he deserves. I will find him. I can promise you. He didn't say anything for a second, but eventually mustered the words, Lake County, Oregon. I tracked him down to Lake County, Oregon, but when I got there, I never figured out exactly where he was. Thank you, I said. I'll make sure to keep in touch with you. I hung up and immediately started packing. Where I was now, I assumed I was about four hours away from Oregon, not counting traffic and pit stops, including that I was probably about five. I didn't want to waste money on a plane ticket, so I packed my shit and got in the car. As I got in the car, I looked at the time, 12.30 p.m. If I timed it right, I could arrive in Lake County around four. This was it. I was going to find this man and rid him of this planet. On the way, I had some time to think though. What if I get the wrong guy? What if the guy that killed my wife was not the same guy on the camera? What if there's more than one person involved in this? Well, I'd find out sooner or later, I, I guess. I had to make a few pit stops along the way, but in general, I kept a steady pace going the whole time. Every now and then, I would have hallucinations of my wife standing on the side of the road as I drove past her. I tried to block these out because I knew they weren't real. They, they couldn't be real. But they just kept showing up. Her cold, frail body, staring at me as I drove past. Hell, I nearly drifted into the other lane in front of an 18-wheeler looking at her about 20 miles outside the Oregon state line. When I arrived in Oregon from the eastern border, I made a stop at the Welcome Center. I walked in and kindly asked the lady at the desk how far Lake County was from here. She didn't know, so she typed away at her desk for a bit and before she told me, she asked, why are you going there? You got family? I hesitated to reply. I looked away and casually replied, yeah, I, I guess you could say that. She then handed me a little brochure and said, Lake County is about 100 miles from here. Have a nice trip. I turned away, and at the same time I said thanks. Let me tell you, Oregon isn't as pretty as everyone says it is. Yeah, maybe up near Portland with Mount Hood and all of the pine trees, but a lot of it looks like the surface of the moon. Flat desert land with the occasional plateau, and sometimes the occasional tree without leaves. When you enter Lake County, nothing really changes. Cowboys are apparently a big image in Lake County. You could call it the capital of the county, Lakeview, had at least four big statues of a cowboy holding a little revolver pistol wearing a yellow button shirt and a bandana. I had decided this is where I would make my first move, and since there was not too many towns in this little shitty county, let alone people, I had a feeling finding suspicious activity would be relatively easy. Lakeview was not the most welcoming town either. The whole place kind of, I don't know, it had a dead sense to it. Everywhere you went, if you saw anyone, they wouldn't even speak to you. They, they would just look at you and move on. I went to a local little hotel they had and told the lady at the desk that I did not have a specific time that I was going to check out, so I would just pay day to day until the time came. That seemed to be okay with her because she nodded and gave me the key. The hotel had no elevators, just stairs, so I was not too thrilled when I had to walk up four flights of stairs just to get to my room. When I got to my room, the door had already been kind of open, and boy did that give me flashbacks. I took a deep breath, slowly walked in, and placed my bags on the ground. The room was small, but... I guess it worked. It had cinder block walls, two beds, a window, and a bathroom. As I unpacked my things, I started thinking about what I would do. 
People in this town seemed simple, not a whole lot going on in their lives, so someone doing vile acts such as raping children would stick out, right? Ha, huh, fucking wrong. For two days, literally nothing happened. I walked around the town looking for anything I could find. I knew there were other little towns, but I needed to focus on this one. I was not about to leave this town until I had searched every single inch of it. Maybe it was the fact that I didn't show up to my first day of my job I had worked my ass off for, or maybe the fact that I didn't attend my own wife's funeral. But around a week and a half after I had left, I guess people back in my hometown started to wonder where I was. I would get texts from buddies of mine saying things like, Hey, no one's heard from you in days. You okay? Stuff like that. Hell, I even got an article in my town's local paper. Man goes missing shortly after wife is killed. Some people thought I had committed suicide, but wouldn't they have found the body? Others thought I had just run away, and in a sense, I did. But not for nothing. Boy, things were getting boring in Lakeview. So far, I had nothing. Walking around day to day, hoping I would stumble across some miracle. But nothing ever happened yet. I was about ready to move to the next town over when at about 6 p.m. that night, I got a knock on my door. I stood about 12 feet from the door not knowing if I should answer or not, but when I heard a second knock, I decided to open it. I took a deep breath as I slowly placed my hand on the doorknob and turned it to the right. I didn't even get the door all the way open when it flung open from the other side and I was tackled by a large man in a black ski mask. I struggled against his force, but he was much larger than me. He held me down on the floor, and when I realized all my struggling wasn't getting me anywhere, I relaxed. I asked him what the hell he wanted, and he didn't even respond. I screamed at him, what the fuck do you want? All of a sudden, I heard footsteps coming towards me. I couldn't move as I was being held down, but as I turned my head to my left, I could see feet walking towards me. They were black shoes, and he was wearing some sort of black outfit a vest, a coat, hell I, I don't even frankly remember really because it wasn't what I was focused on. What I was focused on was his face. I slowly looked up at him and when I got to his face, what I saw sent a chill down my spine and shocked me with fear. A fucking skull mask. It was the sick bastard that had killed my wife, or at least who gave the orders. As soon as I saw this, I started struggling more. I can remember foaming at my mouth as fear suddenly turned to rage. However, the man holding me down was too strong. No matter how hard I struggled, the man just used more force. All I could do was listen. The man in the skull mask squatted down and started to talk to me. So you decided to come and find me. <laughs> I'll give you props. Didn't know you had the smarts to track someone down. I won't ask you how you did it, but good job. He then proceeded to scan me, analyzing me, it looked like. You're bigger than I thought you would be. Nice strong build, good frame. How come you haven't tackled my assistant here yet and killed me? I stared at him with rage. I couldn't see his mouth, but I could sense him smiling. He tilted his head to the right and started talking about how stupid I was going on the deep web without protecting my IP address. You know, your wife could still be alive. You and her could be living a great life right now, with both of your futures ahead of you. But since someone decided to be a naughty boy and go into places he is not welcome, his wife is dead and his whole life has changed. You know I warned you before you even got onto my site. I specifically told you, no one who enters the blood circus leaves the same. You do see how all of this is your fault, right? When he said that, I don't know what kicked it into me, but I went insane. I all of a sudden kicked the dude who was much bigger than me off and I instantly got up and started punching him in the face. I beat him until I knew he could not chase after me, but when I turned around to confront the skull faced man. He was gone. No, I was not about to let him get away from me. I grabbed my P226 and sprinted out the door. I went outside just in time to see him getting into his car. 
I hightailed it over the railways and into the parking lot and got into mine, and I chased after him. We both sped down the little road leading out of the town, and I was about to follow this fucker all the way into the damn Pacific if I had to. After about an hour of chasing, we were out in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, so in order to try and slow him down, I thought this would be a good spot to pull out my gun and start firing. I rolled down the window in the driver's seat and fired at the car. I'm not the best shooter, but I knew damn well my bullets were hitting, and he sure was not liking them. He was swerving, and every time a bullet hit his car, he seemed to swerve more. I was aiming at his tire, but I couldn't hit them. As soon as I ran out of bullets, I had another magazine right next to me waiting to get loaded. Let me tell you, driving, shooting, and reloading all at once is not an easy thing to do. I almost swerved into a ditch a few times, but you would be surprised what you're capable of when adrenaline kicks in. I'm not talking about right before a race or when you're about to step into a stage and perform in front of people. I mean true adrenaline. When it's a matter of life or death, it kicks in. You become almost superhuman. You can do things that the average human could never do, and when it wears off, you look back and ponder how the hell you did it. I'd been on a high speed chase for about two hours, and eventually, I hit one of his tires. Yes, I screamed out as loud as I watched his car swerve off the road. I slowed down, ready to get out of the car and run over to him. But the thing is, he didn't stop. He kept swerving off with a shot out tire into the Oregon desert. Oh, I quickly sped up and started chasing after him. He couldn't go very fast with his shot out tire, so catching up to him was pretty easy. I drove next to him and I could see the little prick wearing his skull mask. This was it. If I could get a shot on him, I could hit him in the head and finally have closure and all this would be over. I held my gun towards his car and aimed at his temple. I took a deep breath, a long, deep breath. That's the last thing I remember before waking up in the hospital. I remember slowly opening my eyes and seeing nurses walk around my bed. Good morning, one of the nurses said. She looked young, like maybe 24, 25. She had long red hair and was pretty good looking. Uh, where am I? I slowly muttered. Intensive unit care. Thank God that couple saw that smoke trail while driving or you surely would have died. What? What the hell is she talking about? No. Tell me what happened to me. I said in a stern tone. She looked at me with a kind of surprised look. She took a quick glance at the other nurse in the room and then back at me. You were found in a ditch in the middle of the desert inside your smoking, totaled car. I don't know what you were chasing out there, but a couple driving the next morning saw the smoke trail and found you out cold sitting in the driver's seat with a gun and lots of ammunition. We helicoptered you in yesterday and you've been out for the last 24 hours. It took a minute to comprehend what had happened. I let him get away, I said. Excuse me? The nurse said, I let him get away. I, I let him get away. I heard myself saying over and over again. I quickly got up, ignoring the immense pain I felt in both of my legs and kept saying it, saying it louder. I let him get away. Tears were rolling down my face. Sir, please sit down. The nurse yelled. They had to send in a bunch of men to wrestle me down to the ground. I let him get away kept screaming. That was the last thing I remember before slipping off into a deep, deep sleep. Lights. All I remembered seeing were lights. The muffled voices of people talking to me but not being able to understand what they were saying. Drifting in and out of this mysterious void that kept me trapped within its grasp just enough for me to see the other side, but not able to get to it. Are you with us? Is what sprung me out of the void. All I saw were seven nurses and three doctors standing around my bed. One of the doctors leaned closer to me and said loudly, Mason, Mason, can you hear me? Uh, uh, I said. As soon as I said that, all the doctors and nurses started jumping up and down with glee. Welcome back, buddy. 
the other doctor said. Nurses, go alert every staff member. He's awake. All seven of the nurses sprinted out of the room and within minutes, I had almost every person who worked at that hospital surrounding me. How are you feeling? Finally. It's been so long. Back up, give him room. Questions and phrases like these floated around the room until one of the doctors said, Everybody, hush, and let him wake up a little bit. The room fell quiet and the doctor looked at me again and said, How are you feeling, Mason? I looked around the room and all the faces staring at me and then back at the doctor. Fine, but where am I? I said. Lake District Hospital, the doctor said. You've become our little mascot. Mascot? What, what did he mean? What? I asked. Yes, uh, we've never had a patient be in a coma here for as long as you have. What? What coma? Easy, easy. You haven't moved in 10 months. You could strain or pull something. This made my heart drop. 10 months? I screamed. I'd been in a coma for 10 months? My birthday had passed and I had no idea. I was 34 now. I still had no idea what the hell was happening to me. The doctor sent nurses in to give me food, and when they brought it in, I noticed something. It was a security camera. It didn't look like the hospital I had set it up there, though. It looked like it had been artificially placed and hidden out of sight. I didn't tell the doctors because I knew they would take it away, and I wanted to see what was on it. By this time, all the workers had left the room and resumed their jobs, and I was left with only two doctors in the room. Eat up, Mason. I bet it feels good to finally be eating without a machine for once, right? I didn't respond. I just kept looking around the room. I had no recollection of why I had fallen into a coma, or what caused me to end up in this hospital. The doctors looked up at me, and one of them said, We'll be right back in an hour to check up on you. Let us know if you need anything. And they left. I was alone. Now was my time to grab that security camera. I pushed my tray of shitty hospital food to the side and slowly got up. As soon as I got up, I fell right back down. Not moving for 10 months takes a toll on someone's body. And if anyone reading this has ever had the misfortune of being in a coma, you know what I mean when I say your body aches like shit for days after waking up. I sat there on the edge of the hospital bed, waiting until I felt like my body was physically ready to get up and walk. I slowly stood up, and even though it hurt, I managed to get on my two feet. I grabbed a hold of the walls, slowly shuffling to where the camera was. It was sitting on this little wooden table in the corner of the room. It was being covered partially by this flower pot, and you could only see half of it. I picked it up. It was this decent sized camera that looked like it had been made in the 90s. I picked it up, turned it around and turned it on. A little loading screen came up, and then of course, all of the menus and options you could use it for. I saw this little digital picture of a folder, and under it, it said, Recorded Footage. Sticking out of the top of the folder were still frames of videos that had apparently been recorded with this device. When I selected the folder, I looked and it was only one video. One video that was 10 months long. This fucking camera had been sitting there recording for 10 months non-stop. How was that even possible? Surely it would need a battery charge or something. I clicked on the video and began to watch. Of course, I was not going to sit there for another 10 months and watch the whole thing, so I began to skip through the video. It was recording me. The whole 10 months it had been recording me in a coma and had not moved. Who the hell would have done this? I wondered. I remember thinking, hoping, that it was the doctors just documenting me in my coma, but that's when I noticed something very weird. Every day, one person would come in. It was the same man every day, and he would just sit there and look at me for about an hour and then leave. I fast forwarded through the video and that dude did not miss a day. Every day at the same time, 1 p.m., he would show up in my room and just look at me. I couldn't see his face because he had a hood on, and it looked like he was purposely hiding his face from the camera, as if he knew where it was. 
I skipped through the entire video until about one week ago, and here is where it got weird. On the day before I woke up from my coma, he walked straight towards the camera and squatted down to where he was eye level with it. He was wearing a skull mask. He then proceeded to say something that was hard to hear due to the bad audio of the camera. I couldn't tell what he was saying, so I had to rewind it. I rewinded it at least 100 times before I finally realized what he was saying. No one who enters the blood circus comes out the same. As soon as he said that, it all came flooding back to me. The deep web, my wife, the man with the skull mask, me driving all the way to Oregon and chasing after him in my car, me about to fire the gun and then waking up in the hospital. It all came to me so quickly I nearly collapsed. That sick bastard that had murdered my wife came to visit me every day when I was in a coma. I nearly threw up. Why the hell was he tormenting me? I didn't know what to do. I had no idea why, but I just started looking around the room for things. I had no idea what kind of things I was looking for or what I would do if I found whatever I was looking for. After 20 minutes of searching for whatever the hell I was looking for, one of the doctors came in. This one was different from the other two that had been in earlier. He was short, kind of portly, but had this deep, raspy voice that kind of spooked me. Up so quickly, I see. Why don't you sit down? We need to make sure everything with you is okay, physically and mentally. I can't remember what happened much after that, though. It's weird. All of this stuff I can remember to a T, but the week between that doctor coming in and me finally getting released from the hospital is all a blur. I remember getting released. All the nurses and doctors waving me goodbye and sending me out with balloons. Some had tears of joy in their eyes. It was quite weird, but I was just glad to be the hell out of there. But then, it was time to get back to work. The doctors had given me all of my belongings, such as my wallet, which had my credit card and laptop that I guess they had found in the hotel room. I had no car though, and I didn't know how I was going to get around. I was never one to steal, but that was the old me. This me was out for one mission, and to find the sorry bastard that killed my wife. I knew what I had to do if I wanted to catch this bastard, and that was to steal a car. The hospital was right in the middle of Lakeview, Oregon, so finding an unoccupied car was not hard at all. And with my skill of lockpicking through firefighter training, Getting into a locked one would be easier than ever. The first car I saw was a 2014 red Honda Accord parked outside of this store called True Value Hardware. That was the one I thought. I quickly ran up to it, and thank god that this town had a total of like two people. Obviously an exaggeration, but you get my point. Or else everyone would have surely seen me. I pulled out a spare paper clip, I had my wallet, straightened it out, it took me about five minutes to finally pick the damn thing, but when I did, I got in the car, and to my luck, the dumbass owner had left the keys in the ignition. Without thinking, I turned it on, put it in reverse, backed up, put it in drive, and quickly sped off. The first place I was headed to was the first gun shop I could find. I had lost my pistol in the crash, and I was going to need another one. No, screw a pistol. I was about to get a damn assault rifle. The only gun store in Lakeview was this small one called Stewards Firearms and Supply, so when I found the address, I quickly drove to it and went inside. As I walked in, a tall, slightly overweight man with a mustache greeted me. I told him that I was going to need the best damn rifle he had. Oh, what do you need it for? He asked, concerned. I thought for a minute. A burglar broke into my house last night, and I want an effective gun to protect myself in case something happens again. He nodded and came back out with a wicked looking gun. Mossbury 715T Tactical shoots a 22 and it's semi automatic. I handed him my credit card, and after once again a background check, he put the gun in the box and gave me 10 magazines of ammo free of charge. When I asked him why, he said, 
My daughter was killed by thieves. Give them hell. I nodded and walked out the door. Although I had totally lied to him, I could, I could really relate to him. My daughter that had yet to be born and my loving wife had been killed by internet sickos. And yes, he had my word that I was going to give them absolute hell. I drove back to the hospital with the gun in the back seat, nervous the whole time that a police officer would recognize the stolen car. They didn't though, and when I got to the hospital, I checked the time. 12.55 PM. The man probably would not come by, considering he had to have known I was awake. I mean, I had been there a week awake before they let me go. I was just hoping to God that he had came this week without my knowledge to spy on me while I was awake. The clock struck one, and nothing happened. I waited for ten minutes. Shit, I said out loud. He got the hell out of Dodge the second he knew I was awake, and the camera he had placed was missing. Just as I was about to drive off, I saw a familiar vehicle pull up. I watched intently as a man in a black hood got out and slowly walked into the hospital. This was him. This had to be him. He came out a good 15 minutes later, got back in his car, and drove off. I waited for him to get a good distance away from me, and then I followed him. I followed him for a good two hours before he slowly pulled off into this dirt road. To not make him suspicious, I figured this is where I would wait until nightfall to strike. I sat in my car holding my new gun and loading it with its first magazine. I went over what I was going to do until nightfall. I knew they would probably hear a car driving down a gravel road, so I figured I would walk, not caring how long the road was. I needed something to carry all my magazines in, so I started looking around the back of the car. To my luck, there was a backpack, so I put the magazines in there, and decided since it was about a good three hours until nightfall, I might as well get some rest. I set a timer to wake me up at 7 p.m., and I fell asleep. The next thing I remember was being awoken by the timer and it being pitch black out. This was it. This was where I finally got that sick bastard, and this time, I would finish the job. I got out and locked the car. With my backpack on and Mossberg in hand, I started my walk down the road. The road was at least a mile long, so I walked in the dark for about 15 minutes. The sounds of night were extremely peaceful. The sounds of crickets chirping, owls hooting. It was quite a peaceful walk. It was the calmest I'd felt in months. When I arrived at the end of the road, I was greeted by this large barn. You could barely see it, and the only reason I could see it was a little light coming from the inside of it. This is where their operation was based. My feeling of calmness and peace quickly turned into anger and focus. I could see one man guarding the outside of the barn, but I couldn't shoot him. I had no suppressor on the gun, and the second everyone in the barn heard a large gunshot, they would know something was happening. I quietly walked around the barn until I was hidden by a bush outside of the man's sight. To get his attention and get him away from the barn, I whistled. I saw him look over in my direction and slowly started walking toward me. He looked out into the night and said, Who's there? I whistled again. Over here. I whispered just loud enough for him to barely hear. He had a pistol on him. I couldn't tell what kind, but I knew if he saw me, I was done for. He was about five feet from me, and just as he took another step, I lunged out and tackled him to the ground. I muzzled his mouth with my hand so he wouldn't scream and started punching him in the throat. I continued to do this until he started coughing blood all over me and then eventually stopped breathing. I got up off of him and examined the scene. I had only killed one person and it looked like I committed a mass murder. Blood was all over me. This was just the beginning though. I slowly peeked around the barn and it was empty. However, in the middle of the barn was a metal hatch door that led underground. I walked over to it and ever so quietly opened it. All I could see was a ladder leading down to pure darkness. I slowly started climbing down, 
trying to be quiet as ever, and every noise I made felt like the loudest noise I had ever heard. And when I reached the bottom, I could barely see. The only reason I could somewhat make my way through the pitch black tunnel was a small light at the very end of it. As I got closer to the light, I could start to hear voices, laughter, and whoever all was in there sounded like they were having the time of their lives. I slowly peeked around the corner and saw four men. Three of them were watching as the other, the man in the skull mask, mutilated the dead corpse of a cow hanging from a meat hook. I could see a camera. That was what they used to stream to their deep website, The Blood Circus. Around the corner, I could then see a fifth man, sitting at a laptop. This must have been the man that greeted me when I first entered the site. He was in charge of monitoring all traffic flow through the site. I didn't care who they were though. All of them were going to die. I gripped my gun tight, took a deep breath, and then quickly spun around the corner and fired my first shot at one of the men watching. He fell to the floor, dead. No time to think though. I quickly fired a second bullet at another one of the men watching. I missed, but without thinking, I fired another bullet that hit him square in the skull. The man at the computer had ducked under the little table he was sitting at, and I quickly put four bullets into that bastard. Two left the man in the skull mask, and another one of the men that was watching. The last guy that was watching who was left was likely the one that held me down when they broke into my hotel room because he was huge. He ran towards me, and I quickly fired two bullets into his stomach. This didn't stop him though. He ran toward me and grabbed me by my throat and slammed me against the wall. My adrenaline was pumping. I kicked him in his crotch and headbutted him as hard as I could. He fell backwards, and me being dizzy from the headbutt, I disorientedly picked up my gun and fired a bullet into his neck. No mercy. The only man left now was the man in the skull mask. He was standing in the middle of the room, looking at me. Well, well, well. Congratulations. You caught me. I must say, I'm impressed. I didn't expect you to find the camera I'd set up, and surely did not expect you to somehow found out where I operated. It's funny, you know, several years of doing this, and I'm just now being caught. And not by the FBI, or the CIA either. By you, some nobody. Well, go ahead, do it. Send me to the same place your wife is. I looked at him. But you're going straight to hell. He tilted his head and said, I know. That, that really got to me. My wife was not in hell. I ran at him and tackled him. I punched him in the face several times. I then ripped off his mask. This was the first time I got to look at his face. He had a small trimmed beard and long curly hair. He looked Jewish, but I know Jewish people wouldn't be as sick and twisted as him. I held the barrel of my rifle up to his forehead. Go on, you've earned it, he said. He closed his eyes, waiting for the bullet. No. Oh no. I'm not going to just kill you and be done with it. I'm going to enjoy every second of this. I'm going to make you suffer, just like you made my wife suffer and all of your victims suffer. I then turned around and realized the camera was still rolling. The people watching had seen everything. I smiled. You all want to show, I said to the camera. I walked over to the laptop and looked at the live chat. The chat was blowing up with messages like, oh shit, kill him. Didn't expect to tune into this shit show. I walked over to the man and grabbed him by his neck. I took the mutilated cow corpse off the hook and hung him there by his back. As the hook went into his spine, he moaned in pain, but was still smiling. He seemed to be enjoying every second of it, even more than I was. I asked him, You got a name? He looked at me and slowly sputtered, Rory. Alright Rory, you want this quick, or do you want me to drag it out? He laughed. Do whatever the fuck you want. 
Now, before anyone listening to this continues, I warn you that it gets pretty graphic, so if you don't have a strong stomach, I suggest you quit here. Anyway, I grabbed a pair of pliers he had sitting on his table of tools and began to break all of his fingers, one by one. I then did the same to his toes. I ripped his pants off and cut his dick off with his scissors and smashed his balls with two rocks. I was going to make him suffer just like my wife did and every innocent soul he had brought in here. I cut slits in his legs and stuck the blades of knives down them. I set his hair on fire. Anything you could imagine, I did to him. He was still barely clinging to life at this point. Well, Rory, I think you've suffered enough. He smiled faintly and whispered to me, Don't you see, Mason? <coughs> I, I was right all along. Right about what? You were a perfect man. Good wife. Good job. Caring person. And here you are now, having just killed multiple people and about to kill me. No one who enters the blood circus comes out the same. The blood circus is more than just a website. It's a cloud of emotion that overtakes someone, just like it overtook you. I didn't want to hear any of this bullshit. Shut up, I told him. He took a deep breath and said, Do it. I grabbed my gun and aimed the barrel right between his eyes. I could see him close his eyes. I took a deep breath and pulled the trigger. His head flew backwards and then lurched forwards. His eyes closed with a big, gaping hole right between them. Brain matter sprayed against the wall behind him. I breathed out and stepped in front of the camera. Thank you for tuning in to the Blood Circus. Unfortunately, this will be the last live stream that will be airing on here. Thank you for all your support. From there, it was pretty much a blur. Me walking out of the barn, walking down the road, not even getting back into the stolen car, just, just walking. Walking down the empty highway in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. I remember seeing this vacant building in the middle of a field and sleeping there for the night. I then remember waking up the next morning and climbing onto the roof of it. I remember thinking about what had happened. I remember pulling my laptop out of the backpack with my ammunition in it and start typing this story. And here we are now, sitting on the roof of this abandoned little building in the middle of nowhere, Oregon. I'm thinking about what Rory had told me before I killed him. He was right. I had changed. I was no longer the same Mason Hackworth I was when I set off on this journey. What should I have expected though? After all, no one, and I mean no one, who enters the blood circus comes out the same.